since this is the last Sunday of the year, since um, <coughs> I thought I'd do a little bit something a little bit different today. Um, Follow scripture, we're not really going to read a uh, Bible Bible, but um, we're going to read a children's Bible. Um, the children's Bible in particular this morning is it's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. And um, again, get a kid and suddenly all your references are child related. Um, but the reason I like the Jesus Storybook Bible is, um, among many other reasons, is that it tells the biblical story in neat and creative ways, but it does it in such a way that it doesn't dilute the grand message of the Bible. You still get um, you still get that grand message, the gospel. And um, for today, we're reading an interpretation of uh, several passages in Isaiah that this Bible has done. Um, and these are passages that you may have recognized were read um, all throughout Advent um, when we lit the candles. Um, so the Jesus Storybook Bible tries to explain to children what in the world a prophecy is. And the way they put it, um, it's like a letter God wrote to his children. And so here is the letter from Isaiah. Dear little flock, you're all wandering away from me. Like sheep in an open field, you have always been running away from me. And now you're lost, and you can't find your way back. But I can't stop loving you. I will come to find you. I'm sending you a shepherd to look after you and love you, to carry you home to me. You've been stumbling around like people in a dark room, but into the darkness a bright light will shine. It will chase away all the shadows like sunshine. A little baby will be born, a royal son, his mommy will be a young girl who doesn't have a husband. His name will be Emmanuel, which means God has come to live with us. He is one of King David's children's children's children. He is the Prince of Peace. Yes, yes, someone is coming to rescue you, but he won't be who anyone expects. He will be a king, but he won't live in a palace. He won't have lots of money, he'll be poor, and he'll be a servant, but this king will heal the whole world. He will be a hero, he will fight for his people and rescue them from their enemies, <coughs> but he won't have big armies, and he won't fight with swords. He will make the blind see, he will make the lame leap like deer. He will make everything the way it was always meant to be. But people will hate him, and they won't listen to him. He will be like a lamb. He will suffer and die. But this is the secret rescue plan we made from, begin from before the beginning of the world. It's the only way to get you back. And he won't stay dead. I will make him alive again. And one day when he comes to rule forever, the mountains and trees will dance and sing for joy. The earth will shout out loud. His fame will fill the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. Everything sad will become untrue. Even death is going to die, and he will wipe away every tear from every eye. Yes, the rescuer will come. Look for him. Watch for him. Wait for him. He will come. I promise. I love this passage. I love it because it explains the gospel. In a few short paragraphs, we get the whole gospel message made so clear and so easy to understand. And at least for me, reading it in a children's Bible, it illuminated certain parts of the gospel for me in new ways. And that's what I'd like to share with you this morning. The first thing that struck out to me was, you are lost and you can't find your way back. You are lost and you can't find your way back. I've harped on this before, but it bears mentioning again, we live in a society 
where the chief goal is self-sufficiency. We live in a society that believes that we can save ourselves. One of the main goals of our society is to be able to live in such a way that we don't need anyone's help. To need help is seen as some sort of weakness. This is why psychological help is still a stigma in this country. This is why it seemed to be humiliating to be on welfare. This is why John Wayne is still the ultimate paragon of manliness. The strong, silent type who doesn't need your help and definitely doesn't want it either. A cry for help is weakness. But essential to the gospel story is this truth. We are lost and we can't find our way back. No amount of self-help, no amount of self-medication, there's nothing in our power, no amount of effort, no amount will change the fact that we are lost and cannot find our way back. And this doesn't just apply to us as individuals, but this lostness extends to every level of society we have created. We are a lost people and no amount of our effort will ever help us find our way back. We are doomed to sin, doomed to destroy and hurt one another, doomed to cause suffering and to suffer in return. And no amount of money, intellect, or willpower and know-how will ever change that. There is no peace treaty that will ever cut right up, that will ever completely prevent war. There is no economic policy we'll come up with that will eradicate poverty. No matter how much money we pour into science and medicine, we will never cure all diseases. No matter how much we change the justice system, there will always be injustice. On our own, we are lost and we cannot find our way back. On our own, we are hopeless. We need someone to rescue us. But the piece that really stuck out to me this week is that it's not just it's not just a world that is lost and cannot find its way back. But the church itself is not exempt from feeling lost. I remember growing up as a Christian, the message I was given that was that sure, before Jesus entered my life, I was lost in sin and my despair. But accepting Jesus into my life would be the magical solution that would solve all my problems. It would be the thing that would turn my life around. If I just accepted Jesus into my heart, I would increasingly cease to be a broken person and be immune from the sins of the world. My problems would disappear at least, or at least the more I tried to become a better Christian, the more my problems would disappear. Jesus was the magic thing to cure me of all my lostness, here and now. And furthermore, I was taught that the more we spread this message that all we need is Jesus, the more the problems of the world would disappear. If only the whole world were Christian, then we wouldn't have problems. All that was sinful and wrong in the world would find its solution in Christianity and the church. But that really hasn't panned out as it should have. Me being a Christian does not make me immune to sin and evil. Being a Christian has not made me immune to suffering. I am still a person, as the hymnist writes, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And being Christians has done little to nothing to end the suffering of the world and to steer the general population from being anything but lost. We are a lost people. We cannot find our way back. Christianity is not the solution to my lostness. But Jesus is. That's why God sent his shepherd. God sent his son once to forgive us of our sins, to raise us from the dead with him, to bind up our wounds, to teach us how to love another, one another, and to gather us to himself. And he sent his son so that we may have hope again that our lostness is not going to be permanent. Because God will send his son again to finish the good work he began in us and in the world. And I love how this children's passage puts it. 
God sent his son so that everything sad will become untrue. So we stand today as his church, not as people who are somehow better than the rest of the world, but we stand as people who are equally lost, equally as confused, equally as frail, but with one minor difference, or one major difference. And that is that, and that is we have hope for a coming king, for a coming rescuer. We stand today as witnesses to the world of the coming kingdom of God. And we are called to tell the world that salvation and rescue is coming. That God loves us in spite of our lostness. That God will continue to love us in spite of our lostness. Until he comes again and takes us into his arms. And makes everything as it was meant to be. The second thing that I think I discovered from this passage, or at least was reminded about, was that our Savior will not look like we expect him to. As the passage states, when the Prince of Peace came, he was not who anyone expected him to be. He was conceived to a single woman, he was a king without a palace or a clear kingdom. He was poor, he was a servant, he was not a ruler. He was a hero who fought for his people, but not with big armies, and he didn't fight with swords. He made the blind see, he ate with sinners. He was not afraid of lepers. He didn't try to make friends with those in power, but he frequently invested all his time and his energy and his love in the powerless, in the sick, in the poor, in the hated and the marginalized. And the religious authorities hated him for this. They hated him because he did not conform to their religious expectations. And they hated him enough to kill him. We all know this story well. We repeat this story time and time again. Jesus came and disrupted the religion of the day, and he came to bring about a new order. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you know, they were too stuck in their old ways, in their own religion, in their own knowledge of right and wrong, to see the Messiah standing right in front of them. But the danger, I think, is that sometimes we read these stories in the Bible and like to think that we are the disciples, you know, the faithful ones who see Jesus for who he is truly. And there's no way that we could be Pharisees blinded by our own religion to seeing, blinded by our own religion, blinded to see the new ways that Jesus is making himself known in our world. But the history of the church, I realize is that no, more often than not, the church acts exactly like the Pharisees did in Jesus' day. More often than not, the church has seen the Spirit doing something new in the world and said, no, that's not where God is going to be. Every generation of the church has acted so sure of their beliefs and practices that they've been resistant to change, to seeing new things God could be doing. And every generation has been wrong. It started in the early church when the early Christians came together and saw that non-Jewish Christians were starting to enter the church. They said, well, unless you're circumcised. There's no way God could be in you. You've got to be circumcised first. And Paul spent a good portion of his letters correcting that misconception. During the Reformation, the Catholics saw what Martin Luther and all the other reformers were doing and were quick to say that obviously Jesus would not be found among the reformers because they were doing things that hadn't been done before. And they were proven wrong too. And just so we don't get too proud of as Protestants, we said the exact same thing to the Catholic Church. God has obviously abandoned the Catholic Church and the expression of faith we have found is the right one. And we've been proven wrong. As recently as 200 years ago, segments of the Church argued, and quite vehemently if you read the documents, that the faith of Jesus Christ would find nothing wrong with a man owning slaves. Christians and slave owners were compatible, and thank God 
they were proven wrong. It was only 50 years ago where churches were saying that if we desegregate our churches, we will be sinful, we will be unfaithful. Once again, thank God they were proven wrong. And it's been even sooner than that that people were saying that obviously God would not be with a woman pastor. Thank God we that were wrong too. Every time the church has been so insistent that the new things must be resisted, only for the next generation of the church to look back with embarrassment at their heritage and apologize and say we were dead wrong about that. Every time God showed up in a place where the church was not expecting him to, just as he did when he came, and each time they failed to see it because they were so worried about preserving their tradition. And once again, the danger for us today is to say that as every generation of the church has done before, you know, well, sure, our forefathers were wrong, our heritage was wrong, but today, obviously, we have the full truth in our hands. And to once again be resistant to the new ways that Christ is showing up amongst us. To once again blind ourselves to the prospect that God could be doing something new in this generation that he has not done ever before. And then we miss the chance to be witnesses of God's new work. We must remind ourselves that just as Christ did not come to us in Bethlehem in ways we expect, the Holy Spirit is making himself known to his people in ways we do not expect or anticipate. The Holy Spirit is in the business of new things, not the preservation of the old. Christ is pushing us to a new kingdom, not the faith of our yesteryears. And in that vein, we stand not as the guardians of the tradition of old, but as witnesses to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is making all things new and all things beautiful. He calls us to break out of our stereotypes and labels. He calls us to look with eyes wide open to see where he is working and where he is moving. He calls us not to rely on what has worked in the past and to cling to the way things have always been done. He calls us not to be shackled by the religion we were raised in, but to embrace the Holy Spirit and the life that he brings today and will continue to bring till he comes again. He came to us not as we expected. He shows up today not as we expect. And when he comes again, we need to expect that he will usher in a kingdom far beyond our greatest imaginations. He will usher in a world far greater than our grandest dreams. Our God came to us not as we expected. So we must be prepared to embrace this God who makes all things new. In the meantime, what are we supposed to do while we're waiting for this kingdom to come? And I've hinted at this earlier, but I think our roles are to be witnesses of the gospel. And you know, witness is one of those wonderful words that we have used so many times in Christian circles that we've lost its meaning. Saying we are witnesses of the gospel kind of is an empty term. But if we take, you know, judicial terms, a witness is someone who sees something and as a result of seeing something, tells others about what they saw. That's why they call out witnesses in court. You saw something, tell us about it. And the thing we have seen and heard is good news. Jesus came once to save us. He is coming back again. And as we read, one day when he comes back to rule forever, the mountains and trees will dance and sing for joy. The earth will shout out loud. His fame will fill the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. Everything sad will become untrue. Even death is going to die and he will wipe away every tear from our eye. This is good news. This is joyous news. This is news worthy of celebration. It is news meant to bring comfort and hope and it is news that needs to be shared. The place of the church is to be a people who bring comfort and hope and joy to the world. That's what it means to be witnesses. 
for two millennia, I feel that the church has been the place, has been the exact opposite. It's been the place where we wag our fingers at all that is wrong and sinful with the world. Our evangelism methods have more often looked like the crazy guy on the street corners with a repent ye sinners for the end is near sign strapped to them. Our opening line whenever we talk about Jesus is all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not that that's not true. But I don't think we're called to be, that's not supposed to be how we approach the world. I think we're called to be like the angels on Christmas who didn't come to the earth and scream repent ye sinners. But they said, I bring you good tidings of great joy because in the city of Bethlehem, a Savior is born. We're called to model Jesus Christ, who as the book of John says, did not come into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. We are witnesses to the glorious things that God has done. We are witnesses to the things God has done in the past, but we cannot be confined to that because the goodness of Jesus Christ is not just confined to what he did before, nor is the goodness of Jesus Christ something that happens in the future. But the goodness of God is something that bursts forth today and it cannot be contained. It cannot be contained to just the people of God or the church of God. It is not restricted to Christian things. The goodness of God erupts in all corners of the world and in places we least expect it to. We are called to be witnesses of that. We are called to show the world how good our God is, not how angry he is. <laughs> We are called to be the ones to bring joy and laughter where there is sorrow and tears. We're called to be the ones who bring comfort and those to those who mourn. We are called to be the center of every party, to be life givers, to bring hope and peace. Instead of pointing out their sins and their shortcomings, I think we're called to show the world the good things that God has put in them and to point them to the never-ending goodness that will come when Christ returns and overcome all sin and all darkness. This is what I believe our purpose as a church should be. Not to be the ones who act as if they have all the answers or to pretend that they aren't sinners just like everyone else. Because the world is not interested in hypocrites trying to point out the speck in their neighbor's eye while ignoring the log in their own not to be the ones who wall off your faith from the world and resist everything new and everything different and everything that's not them. Because God is not interested in old wineskins. He is looking for new wineskins to pour new wine into. God is not interested in old religion. He is interested in bringing new life and new life abundantly. And not to be the ones who point out all that is wrong with the world because the gospel is good news, it is joy to the world, and we need to show that. But our purpose should be to be witnesses who admit we're broken and frail and helpless just like everyone else. But we know rescue is coming in Jesus Christ. Our purpose should be to be the ones who will expect Christ to keep showing up in new ways to new generations in ways we don't expect him to, even if it doesn't look familiar to us. And our purpose is to be the ones to tell the good news, to be the center of joy and laughter and comfort and hope in a world where all those things are really in short supply. And to be the ones who will wait patiently and point people to our future when Christ returns. We are to be the ones who will hold on to God's promises. Yes, the rescuer will come. Look for him, watch for him, wait for him. He will come. I promise. Will we live in such a way that we'll believe that promise to be true? Will you pray with me? So Lord, once again, this Christmas season, we're reminded that you came to us. You did not wait for us to come to you. You came to us. 
to rescue us from our hopelessness, to rescue us from our sin and darkness. And you came to us not as we expected you to come, but you came in a much better way. So teach us and guide us and lead us as we try to be witnesses to a world where hopelessness and despair tend to be its currency. Teach us what it means to be the source of joy and light. Teach us what it means to bring joy to the world. For the Lord is coming. We pray this all this in your name. Amen.